Um, it just warms my heart that there are people who are willing to come into the Zoomosphere and teach and be with us and be intimate with us. And um, there's a bottleneck in the teacher-student relationship in the Western Buddhist world because we just have so many students and so few teachers. So we're very blessed, I feel like, in this particular Sangha to have intimate and direct contact with our teachers. Um, so give what you can. And we would never ask anyone to not be here um, for any financial reason, especially these days. Um, so please just take good care of yourself around your financial needs and I'll turn it over to Chandra. Thank you, Mace. Well said. And it's always a joy to be here with you. I love the SF Dharma Collective. I was just recommending it to some people who were asking me, how do you learn how to meditate? You know, I, I used to go here and there and now I don't meditate because um, I can't go to my Sangha. I said, oh my God, you've got to check out online. I mean, there's just a, an effulgence of wonderful opportunities online now. That's the silver lining of this time. And I gave them the SF Dharma Collective website. So we have some wonderful, wonderful uh, daily opportunities to, to drop in together. And it's a, it's a pleasure to be a part of it. I want to paste my web page on here because I've got some fun stuff coming up in, at the end of the year and then in January, Feb, and March posted on my website now. So that's kind of a one-stop shop if you're curious about what's Chandra doing? Well, that's where you go. <laughs> so welcome. What I'd like to do tonight is uh, start, like usual, diving into practice. And then we will uh, continue with the mind training slogans number 24, which is very f interesting and juicy in my opinion. And then I want to go out with a little, a little Buddha style uh, jingle. <laughs> I want to do some uh, chanting of a, of a mantra with you. Om Mani Padme Hung, which is quintessential compassion, Lo Jong, uh, heart centered mantra. It's called the six syllable mantra and uh, it's a classic. So I thought we'd go out singing before Christmas. So we'll end with the class with that. So how does that sound? Mace and Pamela love to sing. I know we need to do it more often. Hey, I'm always game for that. So, hey, always taking requests. <laughs> All right. So go ahead and find a comfortable seat. And that can include supine. I see a couple people are, are in a comfortable reclining shape, and that's also a very viable meditative position. And I'm not making that up. Of course, the Buddha taught four main ones of s s sitting lying, walking, and standing. So the main point is to not fall asleep if you're lying down. So we can shake on that. And so go ahead and allow the eyes to close. And feel your body, feel your position. Notice if there's anything you need to adjust or kind of stretch out or soften into. It's nice to take the first 30 seconds, minute or so of your seat to really check in. Am I warm enough? Do I have enough cushion under me? How can I make this a comfortable meditation for myself? So don't be shy about adjusting. And then once you find that seat as much as possible, without rigidity, Try to commit to being as still as possible. It's just a fact. If you are fidgeting, <laughs> your mind will not settle. It's very simple. So the more still and relaxed and comfortable you can be, the greater the chance that you'll begin to enjoy your practice more and more because the mind will settle from its natural lu luminosity it's, it's natural, relaxed, open, pleasure state will begin to arise. So begin by dropping into the breath. And feel it flowing in and out of the body. Releasing tension with the out-breath. 
The first few breaths or so can be a nice kind of yogic breath. If you do yoga, you know what I mean. It's a little ujjayi breath where you gently constrict the base of the throat to slow down the flow of the breath to help soothe the body and the mind into relaxation. So it's just like um, as if you're kind of reducing the size in a hose so that the water flows a little more slowly through it. Slow down the breath and feel it massaging the back of the throat, lengthening the breath. So you breathe in, releasing it slowly as you breathe out. It's almost like an internal massage that helps you relax. Let the jaw be soft and the tip of the tongue gently resting at the upper palate, right at the root of the front top teeth. And after you take some breaths like that, then when you feel the effect, you can relax and release any control of the breath. Because in the mindfulness practice, when we use the breath as the anchor, we actually don't control the breath. We just observe it. So now, Release any control or manipulation of the breath. And with each out breath, feel the dust settle, feel the tension release and melt down into the earth beneath you. Feel the spine nice and light, buoyant, reaching up through the crown of the head. The chest is gently lifted and the shoulders releasing down the back. If you're lying down, just tuck the shoulder blades down the back a little bit and lengthen the neck, gently resting the back of the skull against a pillow. Letting the breath descend into the belly and release any tension around the waist with the out breath. Relax the hips, the legs, all the way down to the soles of the feet. And feel as if each in-breath were oxygenating every cell of your body, bringing light and energy to every cell. And as you relax and release the breath out, feel even the most subtle tensions deep within you softening, letting go. Feel the skull, the scalp, the muscles within and around the jaw and the face, the base of the skull soften. And feel the breath aerating the heart space, the chest, the lungs. Solar plexus down into the belly, the front, the sides, and the back. The kidneys, the adrenals, fueled, recharged with the breath. Let each in-breath fill the torso like you're filling the torso full of water, like a vase. As you breathe in, it fills from the base to the middle to the top. And as you breathe out, it empties from the top, the middle, and finally the base emptying. Don't control, just feel that natural filling with the in-breath, the release of the belly responding to the breath, the natural emptying with the out-breath, the pouring out and the softening. If the mind wanders, 
tell it. There's nothing more interesting than what's happening in the body with my breath right now. All that other stuff is secondary. This is the most fascinating thing right now. But notice if there's there any remnant of posturing, of the ego, of thinking, feeling, I am meditating. If there is, just a little smile, just relax it. Let that go with the out-breath. Meditation is actually just a simple presence, a simple being with what is in the moment. Quality of open allowance, uncontrived, without posturing. Just being with the breath in the body, in the moment. Soon as subtle or gross tension begins to form in the body or mind, just soften it with the out-breath. Settle the mind, the body, and the breath in their natural state. Free of grasping, free of distraction. And you may notice the space between thought. See if you can rest in that space. Prolong it. If you wish, you can let your eyes naturally open. If you prefer to have them closed, leave them closed. The method is the same here. We're now shifting from mindfulness to the breath. We shift to mindfulness of the space or the domain of the mind itself. thoughts form and dissolve, you simply observe, but don't take them for the ride. Don't get lost in thought. Just stay with that quality of space. The arena within which the mind plays its tragedies, its dramas, its comedies. And rest in the vantage point of that awareness that suffuses thought, that rests in the empty space between thought. Rest in that. Release tension, release grasping, release mental, emotional formations with the out-breath. And thread the moment-to-moment awareness like you're threading a pearl necklace 
mindfulness from moment to moment. And now from this basis of shamatha, we will begin to just overlay the compassion practice of Donglen, sending and receiving, as a way to cont- cultivate the altruistic heart, compassion and love. But Donglen uses the breath like a simple pranayama, you could say, without too much control, though, that there is a quality of drawing in with the in-breath and drawing out with the out-breath. And let's begin by simply landing on this orb of luminous golden light at our heart center, This represents our bodhicitta, this awakened mind, 
the wisdom and compassion conjoined within us. You could also understand it as your own Buddha nature, your own spark of awakening within you. Each and every one of us has that. Abiding within the heart center, the heart chakra, which is right at the center of the sternum. If you feel the central axis of your central channel, it rests right within that central channel, blooming outward from it right at the heart center. And feel that orb of radiant golden light as the undying, unborn wellspring that is indestructible, this Vajra-like nature of mind, the adamantine diamond-like nature of your own essence. And just spend some time here breathing in and out directly into and out from that heart center, that orb of light. Aerating the heart, igniting the luminosity with the oxygen of the breath. Circulating the prana within the heart center, inhaling, bringing it in, Exhaling, softening and opening the structures, the strictures that close us down, that make us forget of our interconnected, compassionate nature. And naturally what flows from that is little shadows, the little aspects of ourselves that might feel dark or neglected, judged or exiled. You spend some time with any of that that you find here in this inner space, drawing it in with the in-breath, welcoming it home to that luminosity at the heart center. Exhaling, softening, and just allowing that to be. Allowing it to come home, more space, more acceptance, more permission, whatever it needs. It could be fatigue, it could be anger, it could be depression, despair, whatever you find there. Just feel as if you're breathing it into the heart space with the in-breath welcoming it home and releasing the struggle with the out-breath. You could even offer yourself a remedy if that wants to happen. This is self Tonglen. Let's take some time, about 10 more breaths like this together. Without any preconceived ideas, just feel what happens when you do this. Let it be natural, organic, intuitive.
And now we'll start to let the imagination roam a bit. Roam in the term of allowing the mind to alight upon any one, an individual, a person, an animal, a group of people, family members, communities, countries, you name it. Just let the mind roam and land on where you'd like to practice Tonglen next. Might be a loved one, might be a challenging person, might be a neutral person, might be a group, one or many. You have free reign here. Just let the mind intuitively roam and land on someone and then practice Tonglen for a while. And one last little tip and then I'll let you practice in silence for a bit. If it feels like too much to breathe in with the in-breath, the suffering of another into your body, into your heart, because in a way this is a bit of an advanced practice, and if you're new tonight, I might advise you to do this option, which is with the in-breath, just simply imagine that you're drawing and their suffering off of them, out of them, and it dissolves in the space just dissolves in space between you and them. You don't need to bring it all the way into your heart and transform it at your heart. But if you're more agile, more familiar with this practice, you can continue to do that. The in-breath draws in, takes on, takes in, takes away the suffering of another. The out-breath offers loving kindness, a remedy, a prayer of well-wishing, of healing, of resolution, whatever intuitively arises for you, you offer with the out-breath. So the, the len is the taking as you breathe in, and the tong is the sending as you breathe out. The tong, the sending, is of loving-kindness, metta. The len, the breathing in, is of compassion, karuna, that wish to help relieve beings from suffering. And the out-breath of metta is may you be well, may you be free of suffering. Let it be intuitive and ride the breath and let the mind roam, land on someone or a group and then when it feels ready, roam to another and so on. We'll practice in silence.
beginning to shift when you're ready in the next moment or two or three. You're finishing up having closure with whomever you're working with right now. Wishing them well with the out-breath, drawing of any suffering they may have with the in-breath. And really feel and sense them fully reaching and achieving a sense of flourishing and well-being. And then begin to just release any visualization, any effort, and just rest now. Rest in that natural state. And then a silent dedication of any positive energy that's been cultivated through this practice for the benefit of all beings everywhere. Thank you. So I'd love to open it up to any questions or comments about the practice, if there's any any lingering, something that wants to be shared or asked before we go into the slogan. This arc from shamatha, of the breath, then settling the mind in its natural state as a way to open us. You could spend the whole time with just those practices, of course, and that's what we do quite a bit but then also so integral to this practice of mind training, the Lojong from the great Kadampa masters of old. We have this jewel of a practice called Donglen to help to cultivate the heart. So it breathes some texture, some flavor, some heart into an otherwise kind of spacious, more wisdom practice, you could say. So you have the wisdom with the shamatha vipassana blend of settling the mind in its natural state balanced with the compassion practice of Tonglen. You can chat in a question if you want. Okay, somebody's raising a hand. Great. Go ahead. Joe? Okay, that's me. Hi. Hi, um, Joe. Thank you for the practice, sincerely. Um, I noticed with Tonglen, um, the visualization with the um, the light of Buddha nature, or however we think about it, mm. this particular location. Um, I don't know. I don't know how exactly to describe it, but it seems that when I breathe in others' pain into that spot, it taps into something like s somaticized emotional pain of my own. Like I, I feel loss and regret and um, sorrow here. Um, kind of from the base of the throat down to the top of the belly, it's like around there. <laughs> so um, I notice that I lose the I lose the light and just the stuff my own suffering that I'm keeping in my body here compounds with what I'm breathing in, and it's like mm -hmm. so I'm wondering what to do with that. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm wondering if you could just shift and say, okay, now this personal experience is coming up and kind of wanting to take f center stage, right? It's there. So it wants our attention and deserves our attention. So you might pause with the other for a while and take some time to really breathe with that like we did at the beginning with this self Tonglen. Just come back to that and spend some time with that. You know, there's something there, there's a little gift there. Get curious about it and give it some love and uh, time with the breath. And, and then you'll probably feel like, okay, I've, I've shed those tears or I've had that somatic, you know, I've had the, 
the experience that I needed to have with that. I feel complete now. Maybe I'll turn back to the other again. It feels like the two are, be, are coming together in a way, and maybe it's time. It's good to not try to fix them both, but at the same time, but rather, you know, Tonglen's not about fixing anyway, right? So just about pausing and getting some space and working with yourself again for a while. It's that age-old wisdom, right, of, of putting some shoes on your own feet rather than trying to cover the whole world with leather. You know, if you feel that your own heart needs some time to heal, then, then spend time with that. It's interesting, your question reminds me of something that I, I heard recently, um, some old teachings on Lo Jong from one of my mentors, Alan Wallace, that I've been listening to again, and he talked about one of his early mentors, Geshe Rapton, who gave beautiful teachings on this text, the Seven Point Mind Training by Chekawa Yeshe Dorji that our class is based on. And he said that when you're doing retreat, in doing Tonglen a lot in retreat, uh, you can start to have a lot of different nyam, or what they're called nyam. We've talked about nyam before in this class, I think, that that's a Tibetan word called meditative experiences. It's kind of a boring translation, but that's what it is. It's all sorts of stuff can come up, whether it's uh, blissful or painful, or you might feel uncomfortable in your body or start to come break out in hives or sores or have emotional releases. Uh, nyam can be anywhere, f anything from like yawning a lot, crying a lot, involuntary vocalization <laughs> to like feeling like you're really big or really small or having strange physical sensations. They can be bliss, uh, non-conceptuality, clarity. You know, you can have positive, negative, and everything in between. But what Geshe Rapton was saying is when you're doing Tonglen a lot, you may start actually having a hard time because you are, if you really are doing that more advanced practice of imagining that you're taking on the suffering of the world is really what you're ultimately working towards. And it's not like you're taking it on, you know, so that you become this decrepit, sick being so that everybody else can be happy. That's not what's happening, but you're having that courage of the bodhisattva to breathe it into that indestructible orb of light at your heart, transform it there and send out a remedy, send out healing, send out loving kindness. But the, the act of doing that can purify your karma. It's like you're taking, you're kind of bringing in the suffering of others, but you're also simultaneously purifying your own karma through that act of interconnected uh, recognition. And so stuff can come up. And we know that when we start meditating, at first there's that honeymoon period and then there's the <laughs> the reality. One of my teachers says, is quoting his guru, if you don't re live with reality, reality comes to live with you. <laughs> you know, so it's kind of like reality comes to live with you and you have to reckon with that. And so to acknowledge that that can happen when you're doing really intensive Tonglen practice is to just l state reality and acknowledge that when we do deep practice, our karmas become, they come to the surface. It's like a, a pimple, <laughs> you know, it needs to pop, it needs to come up and out and clear out. And that's what's happening, whether it's Donglen or Shamatha, Vipassana, Metta, Dzogchen, you know, Mahamudra, Zen, whatever we're doing, we're clearing that. So then, your question also speaks that maybe there's some of that happening too, you know, to recognize that and apply your, your loving kindness to it. Okay. Yeah. I love these questions speaking right from experience. Oh, good. I got a heart. <laughs> Donna, chat question. Hi, Chandra. Hi, Donna. Can you say more about the indestructible orb at the, of the heart? Yes. <laughs> but it's beyond words, so that's it. I'm done. 
<laughs> I'm not joking. No, <laughs> you know, one of the great Indian Mahasiddhas who brought a lot of profound teachings to Tibet in the 11th century. He was Machi Glavrin's teacher, actually, Padampa Sangye. He was believed to maybe be Bodhidharma passing through Tibet on his way to China, but that's hard to prove. In any case, he was a wild yogi. He was he would like wander through Tibet naked. You know, he's one of those great Indian sadhus who didn't care. And so someone asked him, what is the nature of mind, oh guru? And he, he took his scarf and he covered his mouth with his scarf and just stood there in silence. <laughs> it's unfathomable. So, okay, that's the, that's the ultimate answer. But really, if you can explain it in terms of what's understood here as this indestructible orb, this indestructible nature of your own mind is what's called the ultimate bodhicitta, which is empty luminosity, it is shunyata, it is prajnaparamita, the perfection of wisdom, the great mother. It is rigpa, your pristine awareness. It is, you could say, brahma, from the Hindu perspective, consciousness with a capital C. So that state is beyond birth and death. That can't be stained by the clouds of samsaric existence. It can't be destroyed or hurt or diminished when you're breathing in the dark smoky vapor of someone's you know suffering it's like the sun it burns away all of that it evaporates it and it's this nature of mind this that's we're we're representing it as this bindu or orb of light it's your heart is said to be that which is undying undying unborn beyond coming and going, time and space. It is that ultimate dimension of your your own being that, you know, just takes on a body for a while until it's not fun anymore, and then it goes on to the next. <laughs> and so we touch into that through the, the Lojong slogans, you know, the first six or so, five slogans. Well, you have the first slogan, which is about training in the preliminaries. But then you have slogans two through five, I believe, two through six, I'm, ha I'm, I'm having a moment here, are all about absolute bodhicitta, that understanding, that nature of mind. Then slogan six or so on is all dealing with relative bodhicitta, which is ways of cultivating compassion. Relative bodhicitta is a compassionate heart that aspires to awaken but not just for oneself, but also to help others awaken too. The bodhisattva, who's one who uh, aspires to achieve, you know, who cultivates bodhicitta, the bodhisattva is the one who walks the, the compassion path, actually vows to not leave samsara, not become totally liberated out of samsara into nirvana until all beings are free. It's called delayed gratification. <laughs> so that's relative bodhicitta. I want to awaken for the benefit of all. I have this yearning, this heartfelt wish, this calling to manifest love in the world because that's what we are. And then absolute bodhicitta is that, that recognition of our interconnected, empty, full, quantum field reality of that we are all uh, not separate. That we all, when we tap into it, can experience that luminous nature of mind. That awareness that pervades thought, pervades this body, pervades my words. Okay. Is that, is that all right for an answer? <laughs> I'm a philosopher, I have to say. You know, I'm like, you know, there are these different kinds of yogis. You have the bhakta yogi, the jnana yogi, the kriya yogi. I like all of those, but I think my nature is the, the jnana, which means like the 
philosopher who likes to think lofty thoughts. So if you ask me a question, I'm usually going to go there pretty fast. <laughs> okay, so Donna says, I ask this because it's hard to believe, recognize that the heart is indestructible. Well, it's not the actual organ. So it's not your organ, <laughs> your heart organ. It's subtle body anatomy, okay? And in the subtle body anatomy, you have the central channel, you have the side channels, you have actually tens of thousands of channels, it's said, within your body through which the energy runs, courses through. And along the central axis of your central channel are said to be matrices of kind of energy centers, chakras. And it's said that the consciousness of a human being, perhaps of animals too, I haven't looked that up, abide within this central axis, right at the middle of the body more or less, is the heart center. This heart chakra is said to be the seat of the soul. And it's said that at the moment of death, the energy converges at that heart center, and then it leaves the body. That's the optimal way to die. So that's a big that's a big topic, but that's kind of like tantric, Buddhist, Hindu, subtle body anatomy talks about the heart chakra is really that. The heart chakra is like the portal to the infinite. Okay. If you're wandering, wondering where to go, go to the heart. <laughs> <laughs> because that's that portal into the absolute nature of your own mind. Okay, anyone else? Definitely the heart organ is dest destructible and we need to take good care of it. <laughs> Maybe that's not what she meant, Donna, but it's a great question because I'm sure you're not the only one who wondered that. Okay, so let's move on to the next uh, slogan, number 24, which is kind of sweet number leading up to Christmas. Um, the f 24th slogan, I will chat it for you here. Change your attitude, but, rempa but remain natural. Change your attitude, but remain natural. Okay. The Tibetan is Dunpa Gyur La Rang Sor Ja. Dunpa Gyur La Rang Sor Ja. Okay, so Dunpa is attitude. Your state of mind. Gyur means to transform it, to change it. So change your mind. Dunba gyur. La means and. Rang sor sha. It's such a cool phrase, and it's a very powerful phrase within meditation. Rang means yourself. Rang so means like who you are. Myself. Sha means to just be. So it's like let yourself be. If we were to translate this more literally, it would be, let it be. <laughs> let yourself be as you are. So in other words, change your mind would mean reduce your ego fixation, your ego clinging, because as you know, Lo Chong is all about reducing self-clinging, self-grasping. But be yourself is another way of saying remain natural. So change your mind. It sums all the Lojong slogans up in this one phrase. Because in the beginning of our studies here of Dharma in general, not just of Lojong, in fact all Dharma is mind training. Lojong, okay? So just these, this Chekawa Yeshe Dorje text doesn't have a monopoly on the word Lojong. You could say even Vipassana, that you'd practice at another Dharma center, or Zen, or Mahamudra, it's all mind training, right? 
And so in the beginning of our mind training, no matter what tradition we're in, we tend to be self-oriented. But once we are introduced to these types of teachings, we begin to train in being less self-absorbed. We begin to see that, okay, it's not all about me, you know. That I might think somebody's talking bad about me over there, but really they're just, uh, you know, having a breakdown with a friend. <laughs> you know, it's not all about me. <laughs> Something I'm trying to teach my 12-year-old. It's not all about you, honey. <laughs> So in our early, you know, kind of like teen, you know, our early developmental stages, it's all about me. But then we learn it's not all about me. We begin to feel more capacitated with our compassion, our understanding, our concern, our affection towards others. And then we can begin to see that actually self-importance, self-grasping, this <gasps> me and mine tendency that we have, kind of might be at the root of all of our problems, or most of them, in terms of whether or not we suffer. We can have pain, do, but do we suffer? We can lose our job, but do we suffer? You know, it's like, how are we relating to the world? And then that way we begin to transform and change our attitude. Dimbagyur, change our attitude by stepping out of our small sense of self-importance and directing our care and love towards others. So the second part of this phrase, but remain natural, what does that mean? This is so beautifully kind of Kadampa style. So Kadampa means the profound lineage and it really is authentic Dharma teachings that came to Tibet from the great Indian teacher Atisha in the 11th century. He lived his last 12 years in Tibet and he was a part of the renaissance of Buddhism in Tibet because Tibet had had a couple hundred years of, of Dharma being degenerated. The kings that were ruling at that time didn't want Buddhism to take root. They wanted the old tradition of Bun tradition to be the main state religion. So Buddhism for a few hundred years actually almost completely died out of Tibet. And um, I'm going to close this, the chat. I get distracted when there's a lot of side chatting going on. I wonder if we could close the chat. Excuse me. <laughs> I love you guys, and I'm glad you want resources. But I do like it when the chat is quiet when the Dharma teachings are happening because um, it can be distracting. But, but what's nice, uh, Mace, is that when you have the host open with the chat, so that if people have questions, they can ask the host, but not the whole group. Okay, so remaining natural. This is so Kadampa in a sense, because Kadampa, the authentic Kadampa, there's some new Kadampa school that's kind of strange, so I'm not talking about that. There's the old, <laughs> old, Really good, authentic Kadampas are the bomb, I have to say. I love them. I think I, I feel like I'm a Kadampa, by the way. If you love Lojong, then you, you know, you kind of align with the Kadampas. And they really taught humility. Like, don't flaunt your Dharma practice, okay? So, like, you might be a badass, but don't talk about it. You might have done three-year retreat, but don't brag about it. You might have gone off to a two-week retreat. Great, you know. If you want to share with your teacher or your best friend, great. But, like, don't start strutting downtown in San Francisco with your giant mala, you know, hanging out of your jacket like you know what's going on. <laughs> okay, so don't change your outer appearances to show off or get recognition is what this actual phrase means. Remain natural. Be humble. Remain natural and don't put on airs is another way of saying it. Don't show off that you're a practitioner and relate to everyone equally. And this reminds me of a really great anecdote of the Dalai Lama, of course. So at one point, the Dalai Lama was in a conference and uh, someone was asking him a question on a panel or something. Oh, the Dalai Lama, you've, you've won the Nobel Peace Prize. You're 
the leader of Tibet. You've, you know, by the way, apparently he's considered the most popular human on the planet, I've heard. <laughs> Have you heard that? Yes, you Google it. So this person asks the most popular person on the planet this question. Who do you think are your peers? And the Dalai Lama chuckled and said, everyone, <laughs> everyone. So that's it in a nutshell. See, everyone is your equal. Always practice Tonglen, even no matter where you are, in the airplane, in the market, stuck at home day after day. <laughs> cooking dinner for your partner who just complained that you're making the same dish over and over again. <laughs> Whatever, wherever you are, when you're struck with the challenge or not, as a Lojong practitioner, practice Tonglen. Breathe in, breathe out. Feel it. Send metta. Breathe in karuna. Send love, breathe in compassion. So always practice Tonglen, even every breath throughout your day. That could be a, a challenge for your, you. Can, how, how consistently can I remain in that state of mind? Uh, you know, within practicality, of course. But don't expect anything from that. That's the key. Do it, but without expectation, without anticipation. And then be humble. Remain natural, down to earth. That's a sign of a true Dharma practitioner, somebody who's down to earth and kind. And your natural altruism, altruism will speak for itself. There's no need to put on airs or to boast about your accomplishments. Just be ordinary and don't get caught up in the eight mundane concerns, which are essentially extremes of hope and fear. These eight mundane concerns were articulated by the great Indian master Nagarjuna, and they are praise and blame, you can see hope and fear. We want praise, we don't want blame. Fame and insignificance, hope and fear, with another shade, another color. Gain and loss, another aspect of hope and fear. And then lastly, happiness and suffering. Of course we want happiness and we don't want to suffer. But if we're always being kind of yanked around by hope and fear around that, then you know, it's the mind ruling us. So transforming our attitude, but not externally altering our behavior to show off how spiritual we are. That's what this slogan means. There's a wonderful uh, Tibetan aphorism in terms of like not showing off and just how to maintain your deep practice. It goes like this. <clears throat> if you shake a pot with a little bit of water in it, it makes a lot of noise. If you shake a pot filled with a lot of water and it's full, it remains silent. So those filled with insight, those filled with compassion, those filled with mindfulness and love, feel no need to rattle it about. So in terms of like teachers, you know, teachers should sh usually only talk about their realization on a need to know basis. And often that's only to inspire their students to practice but it shouldn't be for any other reason. And if it is, then I'd say, you know, beware if that happens. So this 24th slogan is a reminder not to become egotistical about trying to transcend your own ego even, right? Because that's a trap. 
the spiritual materialism, the spiritual ego. So as you free yourself from negative habits, don't turn your new perspective into another ego trip, is another way of saying that. Remain natural means being true to your deeper self and having your feet firmly planted on the earth, down to earth. There's a little more I want to share on about uh, bodhicitta, but I want to open it up to any comments or questions about that. Can you either chat or raise your hand? Even just to sharing, you know, it doesn't have to be a deep question or anything, just how does that land with you or how is that maturing in you as you live your life? We have such an amazing kind of time to really hibernate and do a deep practice, especially now as winter is upon us. How is your practice growing in you? Do you feel that you're feeling experiences of less kind of small-minded or, you know, it's kind of constricted experience of self, giving way to more expansive experiences of self? And if so, how does that feel in you? And how does the, the part about being natural land for you? Do you like that? It's kind of a relief, isn't it? It's like, oh yeah, that feels good. But is there anything that doesn't land with you? Is there like, but wait, what about that? Oh, good. Karen's raised her hand. Hi, Karen. Uh, hi, Chandra. How are you? I'm good. Um, I just had a question real quick about like, I've been trying to do like Tonglen on the go uh, since last week and I found myself a couple of times trying to do it like in the car or with my family and um, I sometimes get confused about what I'm breathing in in the moment or what I should be doing and mm. um, I don't know like if it's annoyance or frustration with the situation and or if I'm breathing it in for myself or the other person that frustrated me, or mm -hmm. uh, it just becomes a lot it's of all wrapped up. Yeah. <laughs> what ends up happening, I'm just like, okay, I just breathe it out and I guess I feel better. Um, but if you could clarify more, if I, you kind of touched on it when you were talking just a minute ago of uh, yeah. sending compassion, which maybe is where it kind of lands. Yeah, often our reaction and then the other person's story or problem are wrapped up, especially if they're family, right? <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, and that's okay. You know, it's, it's, of course, we have these kind of layers and techniques, but it's also okay to be intuitive about it and just be like, oh, wow, I have to practice Tonglen. I'm just going to breathe in, you know, the wish that they're not confused or doing their thing or feeling their suffering. And, you know, you can also kind of breathe in a little bit of your own sadness around that and then breathe out and allow more space for you and them. Remember a few weeks ago when we actually did that style of practice where when we breathed in, we actually felt that, you know, I'm kind of tired of saying a dark smoky vapor. I kind of want to say like whatever color you want to, want to do. I've been working with purple lately, actually. <laughs> you know, it doesn't have to be dark or light, right? That's just duality and it's often constructed culturally so you know it can be smoky whatever and so breathe it in and you can feel that also your own smokiness or congestedness or whatever color you like the also that that mirrors that or is related to that right Kind of like in feed, you know, in feeding your demons. The demon's not the person out there. It's how, how you're reacting to that person. So this comes into play a little bit here, right? 
And so you can just feel that coming in too and then transforming it and offering more space and healing with the out breath. So you could l just be less con um, structured and feel. And if you feel space and healing around that, that's fine. There are times when you're like, oh, wow, that person just fell down and skinned their knee. I do this with my kid. I practice Tonglen when I can't do anything. You know, when you're with a, a friend or a kid or someone who falls and you have the mirror neurons that trigger and you, you feel it, especially, you know, if you're a parent, but also you don't have to be a parent to feel those things. That's a great time to practice Tonglen because you can't really take it away, but you can... Breathe in, imagine that you're taking it away, and breathe out, healing and release. I think I've helped my kids a little bit with that. <laughs> I can tell something, it gets a little better. So it, there can also be that kind of clean, clean, non, non-convoluted or non-kind of fused experience as well when you're working with the other. Um, yeah, I hope that that's a non-convoluted answer. <laughs> Thank you. Is that good for you? Yeah, that's good. Uh, does that help? Okay. Yeah, I'll just keep playing with it too and maybe be more intuitive and less. That's less kind of what I'm getting is, you know, you kind of know the, you know, the map. Yeah. And then see what works for you. It's got to come alive, you know. You got to have that aha moment with it. And you're, we, we really only get those aha moments when we drop the technique and we feel it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, a couple chat questions came in. Uh, Jason says, I'm feeling more grief and sadness as I open up to the Dharma. Sometimes it's overwhelming and I need help regulating how much grief I can feel at any time or sit. Yes. And definitely kind of moderate it, regulate it as much as you can. When we open really wide, sometimes it's not exactly the right it's not appropriate or it's not what we're kind of able to work with. So take little bites and, and then rest, rest. If, if a session is getting um, overwhelming in a way that f doesn't, you know, sometimes we are, we're, we're, we experience a wave crashing that is really great. Right. And we feel better afterwards. But other times we don't, and it's just too much. So when it's just too much, just press pause. You could lie down and breathe. You could let yourself have a cry. You could say a prayer. And also you can recite mantra. And we're going to do that in the next, in about five minutes. And I think it's okay to share this story. Um, my mom just shared something really beautiful to me, with me, and I hadn't quite understood, but I, I do m more now. So my, my mom lost her second child, uh, when he, his name was Michael, when he was two. He died of encephalitis, literally stopped breathing in her arms when she went to the hospital overnight, just like that. And y as you can imagine, I don't know, maybe some of you have lost a child, how that's something that just doesn't go away. And the other day I asked my mom, what do you do when you wake up in the morning and you're kind of in a funk? You know, because I'm feeling that a bit with the winter and with this long COVID tunnel we're in. <laughs> I'm feeling kind of funky in the morning. So I was like, what's your trick? Because my mom's a happy my mom's like kind of like a magic, magical being. <laughs> she really is. And she's had a hard life. What's your trick, mom? She said, well, usually I wake up in the morning feeling really good. It's like my best time of the day. I'm toast at night, but I'm really great in the morning. But those mornings when I'm not feeling great, it's because of my, I wake up remembering Michael. And she said, all I can do is recite mantra. And, and I do that, and I do that for a while, and then I, I feel better. Sometimes, like, that's all we can do. We can say a prayer. We can recite mantra. 
in the sense of mantra being a prayer that helps us channel our despair, our sadness, our overwhelm, this feeling of when we really open up to the, the suffering of the world, it is intense, whether it's personal suffering or global suffering. And mantra literally means mind protection. It protects the mind. You can say it protects it from itself because sometimes the mind can be a pretty tough boss, <laughs> you know? And sometimes we need some shelter from that. But sometimes we also need shelter from from the overwhelm of, of despair. You know, it's said that the yogis practicing compassion, like Tonglen in the caves, are often crying most of the time because they're so open to the world and its suffering. Even the insects, the animals. You know, of course there's a lot of bliss and really great stuff happening too, and light and... Uh, in terms of, of buoyancy, but but there's also samsara, let's just say it like it is, is it's a it's conditioned existence. It's impermanent. And so because of that, we're always gonna feel some grief. We're always gonna feel a quality of dissatisfaction. We know there's something else out there, but we don't always know how to feel it or touch it or realize it. And so we have that ache. And it's, it's hard to see others suffer as well. So I think, um, yeah, I just want to get to these last two and then we'll do the mantra. So I'll try to keep this a bit short and pithy. Ted said, the physical isolation I am experiencing is sometimes causing me small-mindedness, getting caught up in sadness, and I worry, self-pity. But the quietness is also allowing me to be more reflective and open to change. It's a paradox. Yes. Beautiful. Thank you. I don't really have much to say to that. It's just a beautiful reflection and I I feel an echo of that. Claudia said, when practicing Tonglen I have a hard time imagining a white light as I send metta and it feels cold. No problem breathing in black smoke, any suggestions. I end up just trying to feel the compassion in my heart. Why don't you try to breathe in white and breathe out black? Or, you see what I mean? These are relative terms of colors and associations with them. Flip it on its head. Or, you can imagine that light being a warmer color, like orange or gold or red. You can actually associate any color you want with this. The most important thing is the feeling. So whatever warms it up for you, okay? If the white is too stark or, or cold, then change it. There's no hard and fast rule. Yeah, and then also if visualizing is not happening, then feel it. Just feel the in and the out. Noam, I've been working a lot with self-compassion. It helps when I am overwhelmed, thinking about how I would be if it was someone I love who was feeling that way. That's right. Yeah, we tend to realize, wow, I'm much harder on myself than I am with others. Why? Why? Yes, thank you. Okay, Walt. I'm the only person in my family who follows Buddhist practice. The others follow Ab Abrahamic traditions. When faith and belief in practice comes up, I sometimes feel as if I am called to witness, right, for Buddhism, to borrow a Christian term. Is that being showy? I should note that my family isn't hostile. They're more curious. Yeah, I think, I trust you, Walt. I think you need to trust your gut there and, and share out of compassion and uh, a sense of kind of finding your, your connection with them through this and sharing something that you love so absolutely, that's okay. And in that sense, we're all um, Dharma teachers, right? When we're sharing out of love and uh, wanting to, to just uh, ex explore different ideas together. It's more of when the ego gets involved and starts like a peacock with its big colorful feathers. <laughs> you know, like, don't start doing that. <laughs> and your, your family probably would smell it from a mile away and be like, oh, Walt, and then they'd probably start making fun of you, right? They'd put you in your place. <laughs> I'm kidding. But, um, 
it's just we always need to have, have the nose out for the ego like oh am i saying this out of that needing to inflate and be seen in this or am i saying it because i authentically just want to share something that's exciting to me and means something to me okay wonderful thank you everybody So, the, the six-syllable mantra of Om Mani Padme Hum is really probably the most widely mantra practiced in Tibet. And it means jewel in the heart of the lotus. Om Mani Padme Hum. Everyone say after me, Om Mani Padme Padme Hong Om Mani Padme Hong Om is the universal sound of truth, of consciousness, the absolute. Mani means jewel. Padma, this is the uh, the Padme is a um, is a uh, just a grammatical marker, but Padma is the original word. And it means lotus. Hong is a bija mantra, like om. Bija mantra is simply a seed syllable that contains within it a very potent matrix of energy. So om and then hong are the bookends of the mantra. And hong is like an exclamation. It's like a, it has a, a quality of fierce, uh, like enlightened love and passion in it. It's like, hum, may it be so. It's uh, like an explicitive or sometimes an imperative too. It also, on another level, represents the, the bodhicitta at the heart, the awakened mind. Hum is the seed syllable for that heart chakra. So Om Mani Padme Hum is the mantra for Avalokiteshvara, or in Tibetan, Chen Rei Zig, which means the one with thousands of eyes, meaning that not just the, the two eyes in the head, but this Bodhisattva has the third eye and also has a thousand arms with eyes on every palm because he witnesses the, the suffering of all beings everywhere. And out of that, he developed an aspiration to awaken and help all beings out of samsara. So he is really the the Bodhisattva or the Buddha of compassion. And it's said that the Dalai Lama is a, an embodiment of Avalokiteshvara. And you see that. He really is a walking Bodhisattva, a walking Avalokiteshvara. Okay, so there's a common melody and I'll sing it with you. Please sing along and enjoy and let the heart, the loaded at the heart blossom the image is that our buddha nature is like a jewel in the heart of the lotus of our heart chakra and as we chant the mantra it blooms and opens if you wish you can take your hands in the mudra of prayer in the tibetan style we tuck the thumbs inside the palms symbolizing that jewel in the heart of the lotus though not a flat anjali mudra but one with the thumbs tucked in, a little cupped at the heart. And this can be our prayer for the world, especially when we feel that what else can we do when we're feeling overwhelmed or if we just want to open and enjoy. So we'll chant for about f four minutes or so. Allow your eyes to close and take some deep breaths. Really feel that jewel in the heart of the lotus. And I think we should make sure we're all muted because of the delay. It can sound funny if uh, I'm going to mute you, Claudia. Did you have a question?
Drew, can you unmute? Something funny is happening. Somebody else got on and, okay, now I'm back on. <laughs> that's funny. I've been chanting this whole time on mute. <laughs> oh my God, that's so funny. <laughs> Thank you for hanging in there. Okay, here we go. Take two. Om Mani Padme Ho Mani Padme Hong O Mani Padme Hong O Mani Padme Hong O Mani Padme Mani Padme Hong O Mani Padme Hong O Mani Padme Hong O Mani Padme So thank you, everyone. 
I hope you have a wonderful evening and a a pleasant, uh, joyful holiday season. I'll see you next week. And remember, you have your mantra. When in doubt, recite the mantra. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Lots of love. Love coming right back at you. <laughs> we're tonging and then we're lenning. <laughs> An interesting practice to do in, in, to interrelationally, isn't it? Yeah. There's some interesting uh, kind of innovative Tonglen practices that Lama Tsultrim has developed, and I have to see that we're not in person. Anyway, thank you, everyone. Yeah, make sure you sign up for the San Francisco Dharma Collective's newsletter. That way you get the emails every week reminding you of classes. I appreciate that, too. Thank you, everybody. Be well. See you again. Thanks so much, Chandra. Thanks, You're everybody. Welcome. Yeah, feel free to unmute and say goodbye. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you much, Chandra. We'll be here next week. Thank you, Chandra. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Mace. Bye, guys. Bye. Thanks.